So it's definitely a nice day outside. We've had a crazy heat wave of about 115 in the city of Portland. So it's been pretty bad for the last four or five days. Uh, we started off with the weekend like this, really, really hot June. So it's been super hot and uh, just looking for the uh, weather to start cooling down in the 90s supposed to be about 92 or 93 today so not bad um, just back at the fix and flip and I haven't been here on the channel here in a while so I just wanted to kind of you know uh, jump back in and say hey guys you see the house behind me right here there's a drywaller in there he's getting ready to uh, spray the texture on the walls in the house so that's a good thing um, but uh, the project took a turn and when you do work, you want to make sure that you are compatible with the people that you're working with and that the people that you're working with understand 100% that they're learning from you and that uh, they're, uh, they're just learning from you or they're working with you. So you're not always going to be on the same page, but you got to work together, especially when you take your money and you put that kind of trust with your cash in on something, you have to trust each other. If you don't trust each other, you shouldn't go into business with each other. And not only do people not want to work, but not working together and a partnership is not a good thing either. Uh, you have to be 100%. So, like I said, experience has a lot to do with that too as well. Um, I'm not naming any names. So there's no names in this project where I'm going to say anything bad about anybody. But just for the viewers out there, you have to make sure that you, you put all everything you signed up for. You signed up for everything. So if something goes wrong, you signed up for it. If it goes right, you benefit from it. And you have to make sure that you understand what your contingencies are. And the contingency is, and it's really simple, so don't be simple-minded. A contingency is something that happens that was unexpected, but it's expected because you expected the unexpected. So you have to be really careful when you are working in a partnership. Another thing is when you start hitting deadlines, you have to start cutting things out. Now this market is ballooned. It's a false market. So it's not sweat equity. So it's not about how many, um, besides bathrooms and bedrooms you have but as long as you have your house in a decent area like this garden homes area where you see the beautiful park and the house is nice safe area people are walking their dogs and um, you just see like just a good quality of people walking around um, where there's low crime to no crime that's kind of what you're looking for because that's where you're going to get your top dollar. You're going to get a sale really quick. You're going to get your top dollar. But you want to make sure that you guys are lined up on the same page, though, because the longer you take on a fix and flip, you're borrowing money. When you're borrowing money, you're losing money as you're waiting for things to get done. So you're making payments. And on average, a payment like this is about three grand a month. So if you're there for four months, you're paying about 12 to 14. You're paying about 12 grand. Um, so that's what you're losing. Uh, you have to make sure that your rehab budget doesn't go over because that goes into your ARV. Your ARV is your aftermarket repaired value. That is your profit. So from what the house looked like in the beginning to after it's done and complete, that's your ARV. That's your aftermarket repaired value. This is your profit. So after you pay off your hard money lenders, you pay off all your your uh, contractors in the rehab budget. Um, you pay the uh, buyer's agent that brings you a buyer. Your title fees, closing cost, unless you waive that in the deal where they take care of that. Either way, someone's got to pay for it. And then you, whatever reimbursements you and your partner or your investors have uh, prearranged. You guys have to understand that after all that is said and done, then that's when you start to split your profit. And the more you dig into your profit, 
the less you're gonna make. Well, for this house, we ended up going to retail. So we got people at retail cost. When you go into retail, you, you lose money because you're paying for somebody else's markup. So the more markup you're paying, I'll be honest with you, you have to be greedy when you're a fix and flipper. It's not for you if you can't be greedy, if you can't be stingy. But you have to have salve, you have to be suave with it. You have to have your group of people. And um, you have to be able to just be able to trust each other 100%. Um, if you're going to go into business with somebody, do a little more research on, on whoever you're doing business with. Um, not everybody's bad, not everybody's bad people, but some people just don't have experience or they don't work well with other people. So they kind of want whatever. This is what I want. This is what I want, how I want it. And then things start waiting on them. When you start waiting on that person, then it's all whatever they want. If you took initiative and cut that person off, they're going to feel offended because they wanted this. They wanted that. They felt that this was going to drive the market in the, in the house. No, the park sells itself. The location, the size of the house being over 1,700 square feet and where it's a safe area, having three bedrooms, two bathrooms, it's a balloon market. It's automatically going to get about 5 to 10% over asking price. So if it's at 500000 550 you're going to get 5% on average over the asking price. When you have offers, people are going to come in. They're going to open it. They're going to attack it if the area is good. So you don't really need to start putting in on all the decks and all the other stuff that give it that great curb appeal. That's not going to bring you more money. I sold a house uh, about a year ago. I had a beautiful deck that cost me about five to seven grand when it was complete. It was made of cedar. It was two years old. When I sold the house, the people tore it down. When they tore it down, that same deck is worth 20 grand today. Supplies and labor. Okay. So that's not what they wanted. They weren't interested in that. So putting Traverstein tile down could cost you a lot of money. Um, having a grandiose budget can cost you money, but you still have to make that money back. So are you just making that money back or substantiating, hey, this is, this, this, this is, this is why it's going to cost this much? Because all you could be doing is just selling the house and getting your money back, but you're not making a profit. So that's why I have to say, you have to really know your ARV, what you're doing, who you're cutting in, who you're cutting out, what and, and, and who you're working with. Now, as a general contractor, I can't do everything, okay? I'm not the best at everything that I do. And that's why I hire a lot of people to do work with me and for me. So they're specialty guys. They're specialty guys that do tile the best because that's all they do. They're specialty guys that do drywall the best because that's all they do. There's no dispute when that's all somebody does and that's what they do day in and day out. They should be good at what they do. That's not saying that you're not good at what you do. If you do a jack of all trades, it's just that you're a master of none. You might do a really good job, but you can't compare that to somebody that does that day in, day out. That's all they do. So you have to be able to agree that if you're not going to be the one to do it, if you have a partner, that you guys agree who you're going to hire. The numbers have to make sense, and it can't cut into your ARV. Remember, this market is not a market that is uh, governed by sweat equity anymore, based, based off of how long you've been in your house. This is basically a balloon market. This is a seller's market. The sellers tell the buyers what they want, and people are paying. With, with the mass exodus of California, they're moving into Idaho territories, Washington, Nevada and Oregon, they're paying a hundred thousand, sixty-five thousand, hundred thousand dollars more uh, for the for the cost of the overage. So you don't really have to do too much to make your house worth a bunch. Just make sure it's clean, it's livable. You've got uh, some really good amenities, but the attributes are their neighborhood and the surroundings and how safe it is. Because people are leaving great neighborhoods that got insurrection from the um, the movements where people came in and started destroying the neighborhoods and uh, started having graffiti up and just destroyed the neighborhoods. And you can't blame just one person. We do things of the community. Well, when an area is taken over or it's in the middle of reconstructing its way of thinking, 
and in the way people inhabit it, the area, if it's in an area where people don't want to be there, it's less desirable. No one wants it. So someone's going to buy a house with one bathroom, three bedrooms on the other end of town where there's less of that or none of it for $100,000 more because they want their family safe. Now, these houses are are ballooned in this market because one, um, it is a seller's market. Two, you have a ton of people moving out of big states like California where they're leaving houses that are the size of my house for 1,764 square feet. And they're selling it for $1.5 million. They're coming over here and they could buy two or three of those houses. So, and that's in the state of Oregon. You know, um, Vegas, you can get a castle for $350,000 with a pool in the backyard. And I'm talking 2,000 square feet, three bedroom, even an office downstairs, uh, three bathrooms, two car garage, pool, and a little play yard and, a, and an RV port. Um, it all depends on the supply and demand. The ballooning of the market comes from, you know, what the buyers are all, what the sellers are all uh, uh, releasing their houses at. A lot of it is emotional. And if that area is desirable, then you know it's going to happen. It's going to be a lot of money. But if it's a less desirable area, it's not hot everywhere. So as an investor, you got to buy smart. You always got to buy low to sell high. So if everything is ballooned, that's not a market for investors at that point. You've got to think of creative things. And right now, it's not a market where I'd want to actually do rentals. I do an Airbnb before I did a rental because an Airbnb, you have people's credit card, you have all their information, you can flag them and you can trucker talk them over form and say, hey, these people are horrible. I would never rent to these people. And like Verbo, Airbnb, people see that duly noted and they won't rent to those people anymore. So that's a huge deal. Um, that's a huge deal uh, where a rental, you can't kick anybody out right now you really can't and if they say you're a slumlord or whatnot or they don't pay or they don't apply for assistance you're just not going to get your money and you're the one making the mortgage payment or they put you they got behind 20 grand 30 grand so they put you behind so then you got to either pay that or they made they they put you in a bad situation so you know the buyers are the the, the renters put the owners at fault and so it's a hard market. It just really is. So the only way you're going to make money is having experience, applying that experience and being innovative and, and creating a way to make wealth. Just jumping in and buying a house for fix and flipping and just doing it because someone else did it and made money. Um, that's not the way to make money. And using your ARV to clean up a lot of the things that you need to... Um, say, hey, this is why I did what I did. You're not making money. Everyone else is making money. Your, your drywallers, your painters, your framers, all, all those guys, I don't care what order I put those in, they're, they're the ones making money. So then you're just getting the project done because you want to get out of the contract. Um, so make sure you do uh, work with somebody that has an experience. They have experience. So they're not always questioning everything that's done. And then they're not making things harder for the people that are coming in or they're not just running towards every retail thing they see because it's got to get done. And you guys, when you guys get to a time where it's, this is taking way too long, start cutting things out, start cutting things out. I'm not saying be cheap or underhand things, but instead of putting up tile, put in a shower, a tub surround, make it look nice, make it look good, make it livable, feasible. The area, it, with, when, you, when you look at a 1951 or 52, like this house back here, and you see that it's been redone, you don't need the fancy decks and all that. People are going to say, oh, older home, great area, beautiful area, totally remodeled. I could put a deck in here myself. I can do this. I can do that. And you know what? If you do those things, does it make you 20 grand extra or does it cost you 20 grand to do those things? And it makes you less because you have to pay all that out of your ARV, which is your profit. So you have to really understand the market, know what you're doing, vet your partners out. And if you don't trust each other, don't do business with each other. It's just not a way to do business. Um, we'll see you on the next show.